What's going on, my boy Rude? My man. brother, my brother, man. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, bro. Oh, man. It's a pleasure, you know what I mean, for you to be here on Rise TV, man. Man, thank you for having me, my brother. For real, oh, man. So, what's been going on, man? Man, bro, I've been trying to stay busy, man. I just got done shooting a cons I mean, a little festival about two, three weeks ago, and Drika Gates, thank you, God bless you. Um, she reposted my work, and man, got like 30,000 likes on the photo that I took. Listen, that people have been hitting my inbox. It's been, it's been crazy, bro. Like, it's just one thing after another, just trying to stay busy, stay working, stay motivated, and. By me doing those things and focusing on just those things, everything else comes into play with the good energy, you know, and the prayers. And, uh, you know, I didn't even ask her to post it or nothing like that. I just sent her to my work, this and that. She sent me back something and said, go check my Facebook. I mean, go check my Instagram. And, man, I was just cheesing ear to ear, yeah. man. Just yeah. so happy just because, like, when it's, something happens genuinely, it just makes you that much more happy. Yeah, I'm absolutely. more passionate about the whole situation. So shout out to Drika. I appreciate you, love. And, uh, you know, just been steady working, bro. I got to uh, shoot for Burner. Burner was there. Redman was there. Um, Cheech from Cheech and Chong was there. Um, you know, and I've just been trying to knock out these festivals, get to rub shoulders with as many great people as I possibly can, and show everybody that my work, man. And, one thing leads to another, and people have been loving it, man. So I've just been trying to stay consistent, stay grinding, stay elevating, and, and the rest is in God's hands. Man, man, that's awesome, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so what, what made you get into uh, uh, photograph, man? Man, bro, so when I was a kid, I used to do it all the time on my phone and stuff like that. And then I noticed, like, I started, like, doing different things and noticing, like, man, how can I make this actual job? So then I started doing music for a little bit. I bought a real expensive camera and the camera sat there for like a year or two and then I kind of laid back off music because it was kind of expensive and all this stuff and I'm like man I need to do something with this camera so I ended up just picking it up started shooting like birthdays for free of friends and just random stuff for free just to show friends you know this I enjoyed doing it and one thing led to another man and people were like man you do music videos you do this you do that and at the time I didn't but I was like, man, if all these people are inquiring about it, why not learn if I got everything right in front of me? You know, and it was something I loved to do from the beginning. I just never thought I could really take it serious. So then I ended up making a logo, making a name, getting my website going, all these things. And then it went from something that people thought I was like doing for fun and jokes and giggles to full fledged 40 hours a week, if not more. Um, working dang there seven days a week, just trying to steady grind, grow my business, elevate myself, learn more. And I would say the first two years, it was just a crazy learning curve. You know, I was always on YouTube learning, always buying classes, reading, going to events to just like learn the areas and learn this different stuff. And then my, I got a call one day from um, Boozy's manager and he's like, hey, we're gonna be up north um, and we don't got a cameraman, would you be willing to come down? So this was my, <clears throat> excuse me, this is probably three to six months of me taking camera work serious. And so I go up there and everything that could go wrong went wrong. You know, my, I broke a lens that day, I lost my keys, two of my cards ended up getting, going bad. It was just crazy, bro, but it was the biggest learning experience that I've ever had in my life because after that, I promised myself I'll never go through these things again because I was like, all this stuff happened before even Boozy got on stage and that was the main person I had to shoot and I'm transferring files, doing all of this, looking for my keys, all kinds of stuff and then he gets on stage and I'm like, man, forget everything else, let me just focus on what I got to do. And the photos, they turned out all right. You know, they, they weren't the best photos that I've ever done, but it was my first time ever in a big event, in a dark event, this and that. And so it was a big learning curve. And then that happened. So then people started seeing that, you know, I was just constantly working, constantly grinding. And one thing leads to another, two or three years later, um, they call me again and they're like, we want, you got, we want you to cover the Boozy Bash. And the Boozy Bash is a big event. I'm talking about Lil Baby was there, The Baby was there, um, Ray was there. It was it was a two day event. There was an R&B event and then there was a hip hop event. And probably some of the biggest artists, they flew me out there. 
you know, they paid for my hotel and stuff. And shout out to my boy Gotti, man. He, he made all this stuff happen. And it's just literally by staying consistent and staying working. And, you know, the first time I did a shoot for Boozy, it wasn't the best work, but he seen that my consistency was there and that my devotion was there. So that's what led them to call me again. And then this time, Boozy knew that, like, I was the photographer. Like, there was 15, 20 other photographers around me, but he knew I was the one. So, like, and there's a photo that went viral on Instagram where he, Boozy's pointing to me, and there's, like, 20, 15 other photographers, but he, he knew I was the one. So then everybody else is looking at me. There was so many people there. It was a great experience, man. Probably one of the most humble, most dopest experiences that I've gone through, man. So, so by you getting into uh, photography like how did it happen so fast that you got into the celebrity world because you know normally you know it takes people you know uh years you know what i mean to actually get to that level 100%. but by you you know what i mean just starting off you know you instantly you know what i mean go to that next level so i feel like a, a lot of it was fate and god but also just my devotion towards my craft um Everything that I do, whether it be photography or just anything in life, I try to do to the best of my ability, reach out to the best people, you know, do the best that I can. And by doing that, um, it kind of transpired into the photo world and people would see the character that I bring around these celebrities and what I bring to the table um, more so than just my photos because a lot of times people are around for celebrities and stuff like that. They start acting weird and start feeling different types of ways and stuff like that and they noticed that my energy was always cool calm and composed and no matter who i'm around who i'm touching elbows with and who i'm talking to like i'm going to talk to you just the same as i'm going to talk to boozy or the same i'm going to talk to drika like just be as real and genuine as i possibly can and i think that's what transpired the just the wave of celebrities coming my way because like it started with boozy and then I'd get calls from other people and then everybody just seen that, you know, I don't know, man, it's crazy how just God works, man. And it was crazy because like Boozy, one of Boozy's managers at the time was kind of like a right hand man to me. And he believed in me before I really believed in myself. And he would bring me along be like, here, I want you to use this platform to get yourself bigger, this and that. And that's exactly what happened. So I took a picture with Boozy, we chopped it up, da da da. Um, I did some photos for Twister and Boozy that day, and the rest kind of just like blew up, man. And the photos were, they were decent, but they weren't like, oh, amazing photos. You know, now I, I can really do some, in my eyes, amazing work because I've been doing it for so long, but really I think it's just the energy that I bring and the dedication that I bring that, you know, if you tell me a time and a date and you say, I expect you to be here at this time, I'm going to be there at that time and don't expect nothing less but the best because that's all I try to bring. And I think it's just like word of mouth and energy, man, really, to be honest. And it's, it's crazy because I, I don't even have an answer for yeah. that, bro. Like, yeah. it's just God, bro. Yeah. Like, he just knows that I was a good person and that I deserve to be in those situations. So he put me in those situations to see how I handle myself. And then people would see how I did and then they were like, man, let me recommend him to this person. Let me recommend him to this person. And it was a trickle effect from there. So what kind of advice can you give, you know what I mean, somebody that's starting off and trying to get to where you at so fast, but it don't happen to everybody, you know what I mean? But if somebody want to get into film or, you know, photographing and things like that, like what would you, you know what I mean, tell them, you know, I would advise steps? them to, one, constantly learn. Um, constantly be on YouTube learning anything you have a thought of how do I do this how do I make my stuff look more cinematic how do I <clears throat> any thought you have in your head put it on YouTube and try to figure out those answers I was on YouTube like literally 12 hours a day watching videos all day every day for a year and then I'd go to classes and find classes that I liked and watch those mm -hmm constantly grind and don't be discouraged about doing free work um a lot of my work at start was free but that's what elevated me to the next level they it might have been free but 
I was working so much. I was literally working seven days a week doing anything in my power to do photography for anyone, anything, at any time. And that's what set me apart from everybody else. They would see my work constantly growing, constantly getting put out, constantly feeding it on their feeds. And I think that's what elevated me so quick was that the constant grind, the constant learning, and the constant post. Like every day I'm boom, posting, pumping down people's throats. And eventually people are gonna catch on and be like, man, this dude's serious about his crap. Man, this dude's not playing, da, da, da. So then that leads to more people recommending you to other people, more people recommending you to this person and that person. And that's what starts the income. And that's what fuels the fire. So once the income started coming, I'm just like, man, I was doing this for free at one point. Right. So now that the income's coming, let me really focus in on how to get my financials in order, how to get my stuff together. But don't be discouraged by doing free work because free work is what got me to where I am today. Yeah, man, that's awesome, man. Thank you, bro. And um, so moving on to another subject, um, by being a minority, right, do you see more of Hispanics in that field that you're in? I actually do, man. It's very surprising to me. Um, and one thing I love about photography is it's a very diverse culture. Um, I've seen a lot of Hispanics, African Americans, Caucasians. And the thing is, though, I love seeing minorities take a craft and go from something that they used to do for fun and take it to a full fledged business. And that's what really tickles me is like, people be seeing me and be like, man, you, you started this from the ground and you got a full business. And I'd be saying the same thing to other people, like, man, bro, I see you going hard. Like, I see myself in them. But yes, I have seen a lot of Hispanics in this culture, and which I love because like, man, I feel like Hispanics are a lot of creators. They, they're, they draw a lot, they do a lot of tattoos. So it's like only right we put ourselves in that creative realm, you know? and. Um, so it's, it's just beautiful to be able to see the, all the different cultures, all the different uh, groups to come together and put their mind together through art and show themselves through art. I really, it, it's exhilarating, man, it's beautiful. I, I don't know if you got a chance to uh, see an interview. Uh, it was a rapper out of California. Uh, I think his name is Swift, Swiftly Blue. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he's an, um, uh, he's a Mexican rapper. Mm -hmm. And so in the interview, you know, he just said that basically like, you know, uh, uh, Mexicans don't want to sign. I seen that yesterday. Right, they don't want to sign to yesterday. Blacks, right? So like, how you feel about Hispanics doing business with, with, with Blacks? So per this is a personal outlook, but I, it's crazy that you say that because I seen this video yesterday, mm -hmm. literally yesterday. This is a personal outlook because Batman comes from the incarcerated world, which it's a whole different world out there in there. And which I, I understand his outlook where he said he wants to only work with Mexicans because if he goes to jail, that's all he's working with is Mexicans. But uh, from a personal experience, you know, my African American brothers are just like my brothers, brother or sister from blood or not. Like I literally, I really, coincide with my African-American brothers because they have put me in positions to be in a higher art anarchy of, you know, sophisticated brothers, some really um, entrepreneur brothers. And that influences me that I don't care if you're brown, white, green or orange, as long as you're doing something positive and doing it for the people, for the culture, like I'm all for it. And like, I love that. So like, if it was me and it was an African-American person trying to sign me to a higher label or something bigger, I'm all for it. I love the culture. Like, why would I not try to expand our culture to be with your culture? Like, that, we're all from the same place. We're all from the same thing. We've all got it out the mud. Mm -hmm. So, like, why should I not be able to work with you and both of us share our stories and both of us tell our histories and... You know, it may be different roots, but it's all got the same kind of outlook and goal is to get out of the gutter, to get our families out of these poverty struck areas. And like, so personally, I don't agree with that, but I'm not in his situation or his shoes. But if it was me, I don't mind working with my brothers, man. I don't mind spreading the love, the wealth and the knowledge to everyone so that they can know, man, 
we can work together and be even bigger. We can work together and do something even greater than we expected. So like, you know, personally, I really, I, I love working with my brothers. I love working with different cultures and different individuals to learn about them and they can learn about me and we can go ahead and coincide and go ahead and go crazy. So would you say that, uh, like since when, when Donald Trump was in the office, would you say he, he basically like separated the blacks from, or created the, uh, 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 the madness of blacks, whites, Hispanics, and things like that? Would you say that? Um, I don't like talking about politics a lot, but I will say this, that Donald Trump may have put the wedges in between the ethnicities, but he called it how he saw it. So I respect the man because even though, even though he might have been crazy and a you know man of just many different profiles, he called it how I see it, and he brought he told y'all that basically this life that we're living in the United States is a reality TV show, yeah. and he made it that. And you know he never said that he wasn't going to. He never he he just did what he wanted, and. I, I salute a man that, you know, doesn't care what you think and doesn't care what you say and he's gonna just tell it how it is. I respect that personally. But did he um, bring the Caucasian culture back out to say, you know, basically stand up and say, F this person, F that person because of the color? Yeah, but it's always been there. So he just basically rerooted them and let them know like, you know, we could still stand for ourselves and stuff like that. But honestly, if you really do the research and you really look at the numbers, he helped a lot of African Americans. He helped a lot of businesses. He, when Trump was in office, I made the most money that I've ever made in my life. So like that has to say something, that has to do something, that has to have some sort of credibility. So, you know, do I like the man personally? No, not really. I don't like the way he stands, but do I like, the way he does, handles himself businessly, business-wise, and do I like the way he just says whatever the hell he wants? I do honor the man for that. So you know, it is what it is. Do, do you think that uh, it, it's 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 more of like white versus black in today's society since he was in office, and you know, I mean, now that we have you know uh, Biden in there, I mean, do you see? any hope <laughs> all right so from that i say like i said he just made it trump made it more known that like basically if i'm caucasian i don't care what you think i'm gonna stand by with my people and this and that which that was always there you know but he was able to i guess that white supremacy he, he just made it stronger i guess or whatever but with that being all said like the person we have in office today, Biden, like inflation's at its all time high um, within 40 years, you know, um, this man speaks and he sounds like he's saying a whole bunch of nothing. And it's like, how do you got this man in office? How do we support this man? And he really is just sending America at, down the worst path and he's saying, Oh, it's okay. Oh, why are you worried about this? Oh, this and that. He's derailing all these questions that people are asking him because he really doesn't care. Like, I, I, at least Trump will be honest with you. Be like, I'm building this wall to separate Mexicans coming in, illegal Mexicans coming in America. Cool. I, I'm cool with that. And, you know, if you give them a different outlook, a, a different way to come in, a different way to support themselves and their families, I'm cool with that. Like, I don't. I don't mind if you, you know, if that's what your obligation is to give these Americans jobs to build this wall and stuff, it is what it is, bro. Like, I can't say or do nothing about the situation. So like, I, I kind of have my opinion and just let it go. But this man Biden in the office right now, he, he ain't doing us all, none of us no good, so. If, if you have a solution, what would that be to fix the problem with, the, with, with, with blacks versus white, Hispanics versus black? You know what I mean? The problem. What would what would be your solution? I would say you know more of unity and st let's stop talking color. Let's stop talking white, black, Caucasian, African American, Hispanic. Let's start talking unity. Let's start talking. Um, let's work together. Let's start bringing these businesses together. Let's start. Um, you know, I, I went to a, 
uh, convention the other day and it was for the toll road and the toll road has a thing now to where they usually only go with these big corporations and most of these big corporations are uh, managed by Caucasian individuals. Now they got a minority thing where they have to go to the minorities first. The, light, the individuals that are licensed first, I mean, that are minorities, they go to them first. Say there's five big companies, they're all minority. They gotta go to them first and figure out, yes, this person's a candidate. Yes, no, this person doesn't work out for this reason. And they have to have a specific reason why that person doesn't work out. And they break these jobs up to give them to the minorities first, to give them to people of color first so that there's equal opportunity. And I think that's what will change the game giving us the equal opportunity, the chance, letting us learn and understand the, the things that are out there, the grants, you know, the giving us the opportunity to have the same structure that the Caucasians do, but actually helping us along because a lot of the Caucasians get taught by their grandparents, by their parents, taxes, all these other things. We were never taught these things. Yeah. We were never inherited with the knowledge about grants and learning these things. Um, just being a minority, I was, uh, uh, during COVID, I got a grant and I would have never known this thing unless my brother, one of my brothers, who is an African-American told me, hey man, fill out this uh, grant application, it's for Mexicans and it's for somebody that's going through COVID and got owns a business for longer than two years. I went through with it and got the grant and that helped me through COVID, one of the biggest blessings. Yeah. And, but I would have never known that if they didn't guide me, if they didn't let me know, if he didn't let me know like the sauce, you know, and I think that's what it is, is equal opportunity for everybody. That's what will change the game. Let's stop talking colors and let's start talking opportunity and money and uh, financials and education all together because, yeah, we may come from different backgrounds, but we can all learn from each other. So let's stop um, with the color and the racial slurs and this and that. I'm, uh, you're my brother yeah. and we ain't from the same background, but you're my brother. I'm going to consider you my brother. And, you know, um, it, I just think that will help break those barriers because like one time I'm working out with this Caucasian dude and I'm like, hey, what's up, my brother? He said, oh, excuse me, I'm not black. I said, that doesn't mean this. So I could tell where his mind frame was from right then and there. So I was just like, no, okay, my apologies. I'll take, you know, and I just took my energy elsewhere because I knew he wasn't on the right realm of understanding, but he doesn't understand because of all the news and everybody, Caucasian, white this, black, African-American this, Asian, Chinese this, da, da, da. and you know, we need to stop labeling and start grouping and start utilizing and start understanding each other. And I think that'll make a big difference. Yeah, to be I totally agree with you. Uh, now, since you're around uh, uh, a lot of celebrities, a lot of rappers and things like that, um, in your opinion, what, why do you think it's so many young rappers is getting killed, it's killing, killing each other? But also, you know, I mean, beefing with each other over nonsense. So, I mean, what 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 kind of what kind of vision you see to the point where it's like it's either escalating, it's going to either escalate or it's going to decrease. Like, what what you see? Why is it happening so much? So, I feel like because these younger generations sees these celebrities, you know, out here on live, out here on Facebook, going crazy, out here. They try to manipulate that. And what they have to understand is they don't got the same structure that these celebrities got, whether it be in a state house that's out from the hood, whether it be in a gated community that's gonna help them, help somebody from coming into that community. You know, we're in poverty stricken communities talking about, I got all this money, I got all this, woo woo woo. And then we're putting it on live, making music videos with all kinds of guns and drugs and this and that. And then, you expect to put this out into the world and, you know, a rival gang member, a rival somebody that doesn't like you for whatever reason is seeing you glow and glamour while they don't got nothing and we're in the same neighborhood and you're gloating, you got 50,000 and you live next door and you're doing the same thing, popping off all this, blah, 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 thinking that ain't hooray, hooray, ain't nothing gonna happen to me and then I'm broke, my light's about to get cut off, I'm about to get evicted. My mom's broke, I ain't got nothing going for me, I got this gun on my lap, let me go ahead and get, handle this business. Let me go ahead and go get this money. And that's how I feel like a lot of their mindsets are, is it's, it's a crab in a bucket mentality when 
we should be uplifting our brothers. Like, man, you got it? Bro, let me go ahead and lift you up and put you on my platform. Let me share your stuff so that you can get popping in this night. It's more of, no, I don't want him popping because I'm broke now. This, let me go ahead and take his stuff. Let me go ahead and show everybody on camera that he, he ain't really about it, this and that. And I think it's just a constant battle war of, you know, who's got the bigger ego? Who's got the bigger head? And it's like, it's not about that, man. We should be lifting our brothers up. Like, man, okay, you know, you made X amount of money on the streets. Let me show you how to make that legitly. Let me show you how to pay taxes on that so you can do something with your money. Let me uh, give you this knowledge that I know so we can help build each other up. And I think there ain't enough of that, man. There, there ain't enough of, you know, a lot of the OGs just showing, you know, that that's not the right way. You know, we gotta, we gotta hold ourselves accountable for what we got and our actions and stop going after our egos and trying to diminish this next person next to us because they made 50 grand on the streets or this and that and they want to be the next hot thing they want to be the next hot star i want to tell you a lot of these <clears throat> excuse me i want to tell a lot of these rap artists that you know it's not everything that y'all expect it to be man i've been around a lot of celebrities i've been around a lot of people that have trying to become celebrities and it's not what you expect it to be, man. I, I, I don't I don't get why so many people, especially the young African American culture, Mexican culture as well, but I see it in a lot and a lot of the African American culture. They want to be the hottest in the city. They want to be the hottest in this with all these lights on them and people coming up to them. To be honest, it gets draining. I, I, I've been in the situation and I don't like where people, random people coming up to me while I'm trying to do something and this and that and trying to talk to you and this and that, you know, it's draining, man. So like, yeah, at first it's nice and it feels good and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, man, it's really not what y'all expect it to be. And I just want y'all to say, be careful what y'all wish for because, you know, there's people that are in that situation that be like, man, if I would've known this, I really wouldn't be in the situation. I really wouldn't want to be here because you're really putting a, a target on your back Riding around with these big chains, riding around with all this money, riding around. There's people that ain't got nothing. Do, do you think, do you think rapping, uh, a rapper, a uh, rapper, is the uh, dangerous, most dangerous? I would uh, say, man. I would say it's definitely very dangerous. And like I said before, it, it's putting a target on your back, man. Because my my opinion is, uh, the reason why rappers have the most dangerous job is because of what they're rapping about. Factual. Right, you know Factual. what I mean? So if you rapping about drugs, gangs, yep. killing, and things like that, and you got people that's out there really doing it, you know, you causing that danger to yourself because you can 100%. rap about so many other things. Do you think 100%. Kanye West and Common and all these other people, you know what I mean, that don't rap about this type of stuff, do you think they have problems, you know what I mean? Somebody look uh, 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 trying to kill them or whatever the case may be. I think that, you know what I mean, what you, you know, produce and what you put out is what you're gonna get. So 100%. if you put out negative energy, you gonna you have no other choice but to expect negative energy. 100%. So that's my opinion. No, I think that's 150% right because what you speak is what you become and what you speak is what you manifest in life. So if you're talking about killing this and that, drug dealing, this, this and that, those people that are really living that life will start becoming around you and then they're gonna start using you for your platform, start using you for your money, start using you for this, set you up, this and that. So I definitely think you're 100% right, man. You know, if, if you out here really, you know, rapping about financials, literal financial education and all this other stuff, you're gonna fruition that into existence. So like, be careful what you say, be careful what you do and be careful who you hang around. Mm -hmm. So, positive, saying giving a positive message don't go far no, that's but if true. you say it in a negative way you get the attention no i i definitely agree but it's like a, a reverse psychology you know it's uh spreading the neg if you spread something negative it's going to get spread five times quicker than if you spread something positive but the way the way i look at things is if you spread a negative outlook and a negative energy that all ripples back to you so if I get any sort of negative energy or negative vibe from you, I, I discontinue with everything you say. Like, I don't, it doesn't, it's irrelevant to me because I know that you're thriving off of negative energies. I would rather push my positive energy and positive outlook and positive word 
10 times harder, even though I know it's not gonna get as much recognition and as much, as much um, exposure as the negative would, I know I'm still right. I know I'm still fighting for something that's a deeper meaning. I know that what I'm saying isn't gonna get taken with a grain of salt or some people confuse my words. I know that what I say, I mean, and I stand by it. You know, it's not gonna be, oh, he said this, or he he might be dissing this person this one day, or this, whatever it is, you know what I mean? So like, I really stick with how you say things and what you say, be careful, because you know, that negative energy has to go somewhere. That positive energy has to go somewhere. So I try to stick with what I know and try to be as positive as I possibly can because that's what got me here today. So I, 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 I generate off of positive ripples. A lot of people generate off of negative ripples. And what people don't understand is that it's the same thing, you know, when our car breaks down, our bills come, and we got all kinds of negative things happening to us one after another, the same thing happens in the positive aspect. aspect. You start taking care of yourself, you got life insurance, you got all these things happening for you, whatever, that positive is gonna keep coming your way. So, you know, I, I generate in a positive environment. So, now to another subject. Um, now, how do you feel about, you know, uh, parents, you know, pushing their kids, you know, um, and, and either in a negative way or a positive way where, you know, some parents might say it's okay for their kids to be, you know, gay or become trans or, uh, or some might push their kids to be gang members or, you know, basketball players. So, I mean, what would be your, you know, I mean, outlook on that situation? So, I think, and me being, I, I live in the hood right now, right. man. Let me tell you that, I live in the hood. So I see a lot of different things and I see exactly what you're saying, man. So like, okay, my neighbors, let me just give you a My neighbors, man, they, they're crazy. They, they, it be wild, rowdy, crazy. But the things that they don't understand is that them being, by them being rowdy and crazy and are always arguing and this and that, it shows the kids that that's how they're living and that's how they are. So then I start seeing the kids being rowdy, obnoxious, throwing dirt everywhere, throwing trash everywhere, not respecting themselves. And so when the kids come over to my house, I tell them, you know, for you guys to come play in the trampoline, come in the pool, do all this extra stuff, you have to clean up after yourself. You have to respect my house. You have to respect me differently than with the way you hold yourself outside of this and my entity. So like, I think the kids really need more centers, more boys and girls clubs, more education places like you do. Um, you know, because if a kid wants to become trans, gay or whatever, let them become that. Don't instill it in them. Don't um, force it upon them. Don't make that the only thing they watch on TV um, because it brain is brainwashing kids, and you know that I have no problem with the trans, gay, LGBTQ community, but don't force it upon our young ones. Don't make it something way bigger than what it has to be. And you know, um, I just feel like giving these kids the opportunity to go in groups, go to boys and girls clubs, go see something more than what they see every day, opens their eyes to be something bigger opens their eyes to understand, man, I may live in the hood, but I wanna go to this Granger house. I may um, not eat the best meals, but when I go to the club, they give me the best meals, I'm full, I'm this and that, had a good time, played games, this and that. And that's what really expands their mind, expands their creativity. And I think that's what sets up the future generation, you know, and I'm grateful for that because my mother was a single mother, never really at home she was always working always doing stuff to pay the bills but she made sure i was in the boys and girls club make sure i was in clubs football clubs all this stuff to open my eyes and then i'm going to my friend's house and he's got a freaking six-story house huge da, da, da. his dad owns a business this and that and i'm i'm peeping these things and i'm like man this is how i want to live my life i don't want to live my life paycheck to paycheck, house to house, this to that. So like, by giving your kids the opportunity to see different things and do different things, it's gonna expand their mind into different realms and different things. So I really encourage 
parent, even though it's crazy out there in the world, I really encourage parents to, you know, be a chaperone, go to, let them go to the Boys and Girls Club if, you know, let them do different things, different clubs, different sports, to see different cultures, see different things. It's not always bad, it's not always down, you know, so that's what really, I think, personally will change the future of kids, you know. Do you think, since it's social media, you know, um, it's basically like increasing the way the, the, the future look like, you know what I mean? Everything is going to basically be technology. Yeah. Do you think it's going to get worse or it's going to decrease? Because, man, um, honestly, you know, you know, kids are exposed to so much now. 100%. You know what I mean? Because of, so, uh, of social media. So, I mean, uh, uh, the parents, they only can raise their kids at, at, I would say, once they hit that, 10 year old mark because now that they have phones and video games and now they can understand movies because kids nowadays you know what i mean they are exposed to grown grown people things that that's clearly factual. we wasn't even exposed to that's factual. so do you do you think that uh, uh parents uh, have a chance to even dictate what their kids gonna you know what i mean turn out to be uh i really do i think what it comes down to at the end of the day is to be able to communicate with your kid, be honest with your kid. Um, you know, my daughter is only four years old, and if we're she's watching a TikTok or something like that, and it's vulgar or this and that, she'll ask me, Dad, why can't I watch this? And I'll be straight up with her. You know, that this includes profanity that you don't need to be watching. This includes something sexual that you don't need to be watching. You're too young to understand. And she'll say, okay, and keep going. But it's about, her understanding that, you know, it's not me being mean. It's not me being, oh, you can't watch this. It's about me observing what's going on in the world. I know she's gonna grow up quicker than I did. I know she's gonna learn these things quicker than I did. But as long as she knows that she can be comfortable with me, her mother, about anything, she can come to us with these questions and not have to figure them out herself. She can come to us and understand that, you know, my mom and dad, no matter what the situation is, if I want to learn about it, they're going to tell me straight up, good, bad, or indifferent. And I think that's what the problem is with a lot of parents nowadays is that they don't want to teach the kids. They don't want to communicate with the kids. They don't want to, they give them the phone and let them go and let them grow up off the phone just because they're quiet, you know, this and that. Um, you have to be involved in your kid's life every single day. You have to communicate with them as if how you want to be communicated with. They understand energies more deeply than any, any of us really understand. And my daughter's so pure hearted, so pure, full of life. And it's just like, by me being around her, it brings the purity out of me. So like, she be checking me as I be trying to check her. Like it's, it's a yin and a yang, man. So it's a beautiful thing. And I think just parents got so used to just like, you know, here's a tablet, here's some food, go do your thing, I'm gonna go do my thing. We need to be more hands-on, more creative. I paint with my daughter at least two, three times a week. We go on the easel and start doing math problems. She's four years old, man. She knows how, how to add all her numbers up to 10, you know, and she knows all her ABCs. She knows how to count to 100, you know, and these were things that I was never really taught one-on-one. Um, -on -one. I was always taught observing. I was, I was always really big observer. I was adopted, so like, I was always watching, always learning and, and critiquing. And you know, that's one thing I love about my daughter is I, she brought the best out of me to, people, parents are like, oh, it's too hard, it's this and that. No, it's, you're lazy and you really don't want to do it. So, you know, I, I say that with a grain of salt because God bless y'all parents, man. Y'all know y'all got a lot on your hands, y'all got bills, family, this and that, all this stuff happening. But take that time to invest in your kids. Uh, you'll see the difference and you'll feel the difference, you know. And, um I know you just said that, you know, you was adopted, you know, were you adopted by, you know what I mean, uh, a Caucasian family, a white family, I mean, a black family, a Hispanic family? I was adopted by a Puerto Rican family, man. Um, so my mom was a nurse to my sister. My sister was uh, chronically ill. And it's crazy because there's, let me see, my brother, my sister, my other brother, and I got one more sister. So. There's five of us all together, and three out of the five are mentally delayed. Um, thank God I'm, I'm one of the ones that, you know, I'm not 
mentally delayed, I understand. And God bless my brother and sister because they're so strong people. And they had a hard upcoming though, you know, uh, medical issues are nothing to play with, you know. So my <clears throat> sister had a nurse growing up and the nurse would come over to the house every day, help her out, you know, she had real bad breathing problems and that. Then the nurse noticed that, you know, I was always either um, in my little playpen or always just on the couch by myself, just, you know, chilling. And she was like, you know, if you ever need help with Rudy, I'd love to take him off your hands. And my parents and grandparents at the time were like, you know, no, you can't take Rudy, but if you want to help with his sister, you can take his sister at any time. And she was like, no, I really just want, I want Rudy, you know, this and that. So after a long time coming, they're like, you know what, actually, we're gonna go ahead and take you up on that offer. And they gave her to which I know my mom today. God bless you, mama, thank you, I appreciate you. Um, which is a Puerto Rican family. And um, they took me in with open arms, man. And I, I, I love it because I have seen so many diversity cultures. I have seen so many diversity things. And I've been always gifted, man. I've always been in the right place at the right time and God is always even if I wasn't God has always shown me that you know that I'm putting you through this lesson for a reason I want you to learn and understand so I really just felt blessed from ever since I was born because he took me out of the household that I was in which was not a very good household to be in somewhere brighter that was revolved around me that you know taught me football taught me all these things and I was able to flourish and understand that, you know, even though I came from nothing and my life would have probably ended in dead or in jail if I was in my regular family, not because it was that bad, just because I had no structure. There was no structure there. Um, I was able to get put in structure and I was able to see things differently. I was able to understand that I was blessed differently. And man, from there, it was just amazing. All right, man, you know, um so one more question like if you can tell you know kids that that's been through what you've been through seeing what you've seen like what kind of advice you can give them man i would say never lose faith man never lose faith always stay praying always stay thankful to god because no matter what i've seen what i've done what i've gone through I feel like as long as I kept my faith, my prayer alive, he's always led me to the right direction. Even at times when I felt like I had no one and I was alone on this earth and I didn't want to be with no one and I felt like nobody really loved me for me because when I was adopted, I never got that genuine love and it was just different for me, man. And I felt like God was always there guiding me through the whole situation, you know. I would say really just stay focused on your faith, on really what you believe in, and God will never, ever put you in the wrong predicament, and he'll let you learn from all these lessons to grow, and that's what really I'm at now, is, you know, I got to learn from all these lessons and stepping stones as a kid, and now I'm growing a business, now I'm flourishing, now I'm trying to do better, and, you know, just stay with that faith, religion, and stay blessed, and so so if somebody want to reach out to you man uh what's what's the uh the contact from the social media or email yep. i mean where they can find you at so on my email is rudy rodriguez 1993 at gmail.com all of my platforms um instagram facebook are is all drowsy rodriguez d-r-o-w-z under dash y rodriguez and last but not least, um, my website is rodriguezproduction.com. And you can reach me on any one of those. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people where you message me and I'm not gonna ever get back to you. I read all my inboxes. I get back to everybody if you're on some relevant stuff. And let's spread this positivity. Let's spread these blessings. Thank you for having me, my brother. Man, it's a blessing, bro. All right, man, I appreciate you, Rudy, for having you, man. You know, man, it was a pleasure, man. Uh, until next time, man, you know, uh, this, is just, this is just the beginning, you oh, know what I mean? Know. Uh, until the next time, man, we gon' we gon' we gon' we gon' talk it and we gonna chop it up even more. It's a lot to talk about, you know what I mean? I, I appreciate really know, you for man. coming to We're Rise deep TV, dive, man. man. Every time we come together, we deep dive in these conversations. Yeah. I love it because it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like talking to my brother 
one-on-one, -on -one, man. And it's just, we deep dive in these conversations because we've been here before, man. Absolutely. And people don't really understand that, man. You're my brother. I appreciate you for having me, brother. Uh, you too, man, really. For sure. All right.